Back over here at the fireplace mantle build and we're gonna jump right into it. If you haven't been following along, here's what we've done so far. So that catches you up to speed on where we're at. We've got this Wayne Scott unit with the raised panel and a beaded profile trimming out around. And now we're gonna trim this thing out. And the first thing we need to do is shim out our block. So check this out. This was our plinth block that we made like in episode two of this series. And I didn't account for the marble or stone. I actually think this is quartz. I keep calling it marble. I'm just gonna call it stone from now on. The stone and the finished Windsor boards are not in the same plane. The Windsor boards are a quarter inch set back. So I put these two little shims right here, just pin those on the back. And when I put this in now, it'll be flush and it'll line up. So this is ready to go, but first we gotta get our back band on our little stone casing, this one that's running around our stone. So that's the first thing I gotta do. We have our back band in place on our Wayne Scott unit now. I'm not gonna run it around the whole cross-sided corner mantle detail right now because I need to leave it off so whenever I build the uh, over mantle up. But I do need this in place so I can go ahead and install our plinth block. You can see it's just loosely in here. So we'll go ahead and plumb that up and attach it with trim head screws. Our level on here, checking for plumb, which we are. And then before we're screwing in, we're checking for proper reveals at the top where our casing detail sets on our block. So this thing looks good to go and we can screw it in. So with our back band in and our plinth block in, we can now move to installing our base and our base is gonna be this profile right here. It's another Windsor One molding. This is a big seven and a quarter inch tall by inch and an eighth thick base profile. And we're gonna just wrap it around our wainscot build here. But you'll notice in here, there's gonna be an issue because why in the world did I leave this gap here? I left this, you know, where it's not mitered here. Well, that's where this molding comes in. This is called a cork molding or a pencil molding, depending on what mill shop you're talking to. But it's basically a big rounded bead with that little 90 degree corner in the back. And that 90 degree corner is exactly where this is gonna fit in. I mentioned this briefly in the last episode, and that's that detail there. But still, if I just put this here, it's not, it's not gonna look good if I have a gap kind of all around this cork molding. So what I need to do is I need to rip down a block that is one inch by one inch and as tall as this base so I can set it in there and it can then support this pencil molding. And here we have our inch by inch block. And this block will of course drop right in there. And then I can now wrap my base around this, know exactly where to cut my base. And I now have a support for that cork molding. And I cut this block just a hair undersized so I can get it perfectly level with the top of my base. The last thing I want is it to be proud of my base and sticking up. So I'm happy with that right there. And I'll just keep this pinched and then send it home with a finished nail. And we can bring this back over and that feels perfect. You can just mark the back of it. On all these small pieces, that's one thing I do. I like to kind of just hold them up and pencil mark them because it's just a lot easier than stretching out the tape and you're gonna be dead on accurate. So that is the next thing we'll do. We will go ahead and wrap the base around this. So 
we get our two pieces of base in that we just cut. And there is a beautiful, beautiful profile. We're perfectly lined up with our little block here, little support. And uh, I'll go ahead and pre-glue this. I am gonna be using these miter spring clamps for pre-assembly on these pieces. And I don't have my spreader though, the little tool that's like pliers that separates it. So I'm gonna have to spread this by hand and then clamp it on there, which isn't ideal, but it will work. Get it in position. I've got my profile right where I want it, and I'm just gonna take my clamps and spread them by hand. This is not ideal at all, because it's hard to hold the molding and do this, but once I get a couple of them on, then it becomes easier. Bam! And look at that gorgeous profile right there. That big sweeping cove at the top on that chunky seven and a quarter by inch and an eighth molding right there. Man, that looks good. Having the right moldings is half the battle. And I can actually shoot this on already. I don't even have to wait for that glue. Go ahead and give it a lock now too while we're at it. Lock those moldings together. I'm gonna go ahead and prime our little block on top because when I drop the pencil on, I would rather just have primer under there so it kind of looks finished off. I mean, every I say this in every video of this series, every piece that we add to this build, it just makes it that much more glorious. So we got our back band, we got our plinth block, we got our base installed now, that chunky seven and a quarter inch tall by inch and an eighth, giant projection off the wall just really kind of gracefully builds up and gives this thing a strong foundation. And this whole pedestal, essentially, what we're building here, it's like a wainscot comes from the classical detail pedestal. So that's essentially what we're making. And the next piece we're gonna add is technically a surbase. Um, we would call it a chair rail today, but I'm just from everything I learned, I don't like the term chair rail anymore. And I don't wanna use it anymore because of where it comes from, it's like, People measured the backs of chairs and then they put their chair rail at that height and it's just not proper because chairs are like 40 inches sometimes, even higher. So to give you an idea, we are sitting at 29 and three quarters to the top rail here. And it'll go up to about 30 and a half when I add my final moldings on, but we're nowhere near 40 inches. This is a very compressed piece and if you think of classicism, the the column, how everything is expressed in classical details. The pedestal, which is this, is pretty small. The column is kind of the big thing and the entablature up at the top is kind of the, the showpiece. But this right here, we're gonna be laying out next for our surbase. That's what I'm gonna call it. You'll have to get used to that term. We're not calling it a chair rail. Uh, so with our back band on, we have a two and a quarter inch reveal from back band to panel. So our style is two and a quarter. This style, of course, is two and a quarter from panel to where the outside is and where our pencil molding will start. And I was thinking about this. I kind of got worried because I've never built something like this. I was like, should I have taken this whole reveal into consideration? But when I'm holding this up and I was thinking about it, I was like, I don't think I would change anything because I think as the way this reads with your eye, this is still, this two and a quarter still makes sense with this two and a quarter. I was thinking, oh man, what are we at? What, let me see. So with the quirk molding, we're at three and a half. Oh man, did I mess something up? It's like, no, I think it still reads properly. And speaking of this, we got that little piece primed and prepped, ready to accept that it just sits right there perfectly in place. So what we did here, where we had to put that one by one block in, we're gonna have to put that up here as well for that surbase piece. So what I need to do, I need to measure up. We're gonna have that same two and a quarter inch reveal. So from top of panel to where that next molding starts is two and a quarter and I'm just doing it this way. And we'll go right there. Actually, I marked this one wrong. This needs to be 
right there. So I'll level that line up. Then we can mark this right here and that's where our surbase molding will be installed. We'll install it right on that pencil line. So that same one inch by one inch block just cut down to size to fit where our surbase molding will go. And I'm just gonna line up this block with that straight line that I just made. So we'll go about right there. And then this just gets shot in with 15 gauge. So with that block in place, it is now ready to have the first molding wrapped around it. And that is going to be this little profile right here. It's just a simple cove. And it's gonna be installed, as I mentioned, right on that line. Very similar, actually exactly, to what we did with our base down there. So I'll get this piece installed first. And this piece will be part of a two component profile that makes up that sur base there. We won't get to the second part today because we need to start building our overmantle up on top. And then I'm gonna have it kind of like a pitched. It'll be a custom molding that I make, but as crazy as it sounds, all this awesome trim, in my opinion, is really cool stuff. The funny thing is I'm most looking forward to is that little pencil molding that's gonna go in the corner. It's just easy too, it's just two straight cuts, bam, shoot it in. Um, but that'll be after this little profile. So let's knock this out and then see the star of the show, in my opinion, which would be the pencil. And just like we did with our base pieces, I'm bringing in pieces that are a little oversized and marking them in place for accuracy. For little crowns like this, especially if I'm not gonna be running a bunch of it, I'll just kind of cradle it by hand. I'm not gonna set up any kind of stop block or anything, or a crown stop rather, to cradle it. But I basically just roll it down, feel when it flattens out, and just keep pressure on it right there. And you can always look from the side to make sure you're flat against the table before you make a cut. Doing a little dry fit, of course, before we put some glue on it. Nice, I like that. So we'll go ahead and put some glue on this and get it clamped up. I get a lot of questions about the CA glue. I'm just thinking of that because I'm about to pre-assemble this. We don't use a lot of it anymore. I mean, we, we do use a lot of it because we use it to glue up jigs or if we have like a tear out or something blows out, we use it for repairs if something happens. But when it's miter to miter like this, wood to wood, I've kind of gotten away from it. I'll show you something where I incorporate uh, wood glue and CA glue right here. But um, we used to use a lot of MDF and now we're not using as much MDF and CA glue just doesn't have a good grab with woods, especially pine. Like if you, if I just CA glue this and then drop it, it'll just snap. It doesn't have any holding power to it. It will initially tack and grab, but over the long haul, it's, you could just pull it apart. So I've been using two glues on small pieces. And what I'm doing is I'm putting a little bit of wood glue to act as the main source of, you know, grabbing power and then you know I'm using CA glue to act as a clamp so to speak. Um, I could use miter spring clamps on this but it's just so quick and easy to do the CA glue so that's exactly what we're gonna do. I'll put CA glue, I mean excuse me, wood glue kind of in the middle here about like that and then I'll put some CA glue at the top and bottom of that. So hopefully the camera picks this up, but 
kind of a crazy little <laughs> adhesive process going on here. So nothing else changes. You know, I could kind of spread my, my wood glue around like that. That's fine. And then I just, you know, spray the activator on my other side, my other piece. And then it's just like if you were using CA glue at this point. So we'll just line them up and compress. Hold it for a good few seconds. For some reason that activator like deactivates my primer. I've noticed that it's probably like a like a lacquer thinner. You that's crazy. You actually I wonder if you could just use lacquer thinner as CA glue activator. That would be a good that would be a good hack right there because you could probably save a lot of money because lacquer thinner is like what 20 bucks a gallon and that CA glue stuff's expensive so um, yeah there we go our nice pre-assembled piece we can just install it as such so yeah we'll do that so we'll get this in position ready to install and the most important thing here is that this is level with my line and we know that the block we put in is level with my line. I have a line on this side as well for reference so all I have to do really for this is get it flush with my block here at the end and shoot it here and then I can kind of pivot off this and find my pencil line over there. So we'll do just that. I'll get flush here and I'm going to use 18 gauge brads for this. This is a small molding. I don't really need to just blow through it with a big 15 gauge. All right, so I'm good on my corner. And I'll just lock it in place along my pencil line. Dang, that looks cool. You can see what I'm saying here. This could be anything. So we'll get right there. I am. That is freaking glorious. When our overmantle comes and sits on our pedestal, you know, it'll be similar to that. So we'll have a seam right there and we're gonna build panel up. So then we'll have a pitched molding right here, a custom piece, something like this that I'll make. That kind of has like an exterior feel to it. So it'll be pitched like that. I actually really like this. This is just a piece of scrap that I had. I might use this. This is like a 9 16 um, little piece of Windsor molding, but it's just gonna pitch something like that. I think that'll be cool. That's, that might be an aggressive pitch right there, but you get the point. Maybe just a subtle one like that. And this overhang's probably too much because this overhang has to be set back behind this back band anyways. So we got a little more calculation to do there. But something like that, the best part of this may be the easiest. We're literally gonna just measure this and straight to straight cut it. 20 and three quarters. And finally, we get to bring this pencil molding in. <laughs> that is such an awesome detail right there. Especially from this view, I'll show you guys from this view. Like it just, it all makes sense. It looks so cool, like I'm really proud of this. And I didn't come up with this. And you know, it makes me think what, what Brent always talks about. If he said this one time, he said it a thousand times. The playbook that we use in modern building is like two or three pages long. Like we do the same thing over and over and over and it just gets boring. But the playbook of historic millwork and building is thousands of pages to choose from. 
And that's literally what this is. I literally copied what I saw in traditional American rooms, a book that Brent Hull and Christine Frank wrote. This is it, I copied it. I didn't come up with this, like I literally copied this. I, my organization and what moldings I chose is a little bit different. You know, my reveals, I chose all that, but the concept is from historic building and look what you can do when you kind of get creative and look to the past. It's crazy. It's absolutely beautiful. So, I mean, to say I'm happy is an understatement. This, is, this brings me true joy to see this come together. So, to install this, we will use 15 gauge nails. This is a thick molding right here. So, yeah, let's get this sucker installed. Absolutely amazing. I cannot believe how good this come out. There was times throughout this process when I was like, oh no, this is getting, I don't know if this is going to look right. Like it kind of looks weird. Like leaving this corner off is kind of bothering me for a while because I kind of just do this on the weekends and I would walk by it through the week, you know, normal work week and see it and like, I don't know if that's going to work out. But just trusting the process there and you know, going with it, going with what the other historic rooms look like in that book. It just gave me confidence to, to continue on, and I'm so glad I did. Look at this. I've never created a wainscot this beautiful before, and this properly scaled out. I mean, this looks like a classical pedestal. It's awesome. And then we're going to have a cross-fitted corner right here with the mantle. And a lot of people were saying like, hey, you know, you're going to do all this stuff and then you're going to move. Maybe that's, that's an option. I'm not afraid of moving, but I'm having fun while I'm here and I'm still going to do the best that I can with, with what I do. I don't know if I'll live here forever. Just because I do cool stuff doesn't mean I have to stay here and live here forever. I think the next person will appreciate this as well. And then wherever I go next, I know how to do this now and I might even change things up next time. I don't think I would change anything about this. This looks amazing, but you know what I mean. The processes and the confidence that you get when you build something like this for the first time. It's, uh, it's a little nerve wracking, but then you do it and you get this moment that I'm experiencing right now. Like, I am so happy with this. Good times and a great build so far. And I look forward to continue on in the next one.